Hey there! Let's explore some of the interesting things that happened in the web dev space in the past month. We'll start with one of my favorite frameworks these days, Astro. Support for view transitions is probably the highlight of their new 2.9 release. As you already know, with Astro you can build HTML-first performant apps using the island's architecture and smart hydration strategies. The resulting apps are multi-page based, meaning that navigation between pages will cause the browser to send a GET response to the server and refresh the entire page for each request. Of course, the alternative to MPAs are the single-page applications, which don't require a full refresh when switching between pages. Anyhow, that full refresh was making it rather difficult to implement smooth transitions or animations when navigating between pages. To solve this problem, we got a new web platform API called the View Transition, also known as Page Transitions. It does not have full support in all browsers yet, but for the browsers that do, you can now use this feature via Astro as well. Any experimental Astro feature needs to be defined accordingly in the config file, and once it is registered, you can easily use it to enhance your app's user experience. Next, let's step into the Dino world for a minute, where we got two new releases. On one hand, Fresh 1.3 was released with a handful of developer experience improvements and better error handling support. The Dino team is committed to making Fresh a real player in the meta framework space, and it is interesting to see how things will turn out in the end. Fresh is gaining a lot of popularity in recent months, but it has some pretty big shoes to fill, considering some of the established front-end frameworks we all know and love. The competitive advantage Fresh has to offer is the entire Dino ecosystem, which provides a very powerful JavaScript runtime and state-of-the-art edge deployments via Dino Deploy. And, since I mentioned the runtime, Dino 1.35 was released with a simplified, more performant way of building web servers. One of Dino's goals is to remove boilerplate and improve the dev experience, and this is obvious in every release. You don't believe me? Check this out. This is how easy it is to start a web server in Dino these days. I'm a big fan of this platform, and I have a lot of Dino videos planned for the future, so be sure to click the subscribe button if you want to improve your Dino skills. Oh, and the Dino team is also working towards full Node.js interoperability in version 2, so you should really keep an eye on what these guys are doing. In July, the Tailwind community had their first live event. The keynote is worth watching since it goes not only through their plans for the future, but it also contains a good explanation for why Tailwind's architecture might be the best approach when working on large projects. You either love or hate Tailwind CSS, but, regardless of your feelings, I strongly believe you should look into the thought process behind using utility classes and atomic CSS. Coincidentally, I have a TLDR video on this exact topic, and you can check it out in the top right corner. The keynote contains hints to some other big projects like Tailwind Oxide with a unified toolchain, improved performance via Lightning CSS, and simplified configuration, or Catalyst, a React UI kit for Tailwind CSS. Next, let's take a quick detour and discuss a more specialized JS library. Remotion reached version 4 with quite a few updates and new features. For those unfamiliar with it, with Remotion you can build and render high-quality videos using JavaScript and React. This is a tool I'm using often when working on my videos, but even though it might not be useful for your day-to-day -day activity, I believe it is interesting to see what we can achieve with this silly little language called JavaScript these days. Prisma also reached version 5, and their release announcement outlined something we all should be aware of. It's all about serverless these days. Prisma is now faster and replaced their previous GraphQL-based protocol with a JSON-based one. The results are pretty mind-blowing. Startup times are also key when deploying serverless applications, and this is how the startup performance of an app deployed to AWS Lambda with a schema containing 500 models looks like in version 4 compared to version 5. And, since we are talking storage solutions, Tinybase reached version 4 and it offers modules to connect SQLite databases, both in the browser and on the server. If this is your first time hearing about Tinybase, this is a lightweight reactive data store for local first web apps. You can store your data in structured tables, rows, and cells, or in the key value format. Tinybase manages to achieve quite a lot despite its small size, and its reactivity implementation makes it a good fit for the modern web app development we are used to. Before wrapping things up, I want to mention a big event from the React space. Dan Abramov is leaving Meta, and this is the end of an era. Of course, the React development will go on, but I believe Dan really deserves a shout-out for all the work he did in the community for the past years. And, finally, it's always a blast to follow Douglas Crockford. He was always a big advocate for the JavaScript language, and I found one of his recent statements very interesting. 
For a long while, he believed the DOM to be a poorly designed, poorly implemented, and full of inconsistencies API, so all these pain points had to be hidden by libraries or frameworks. However, in recent years, the browser spent quite a lot of time improving the situation. As a result, Douglas is now recommending to abandon libraries, which have grown into bloated platforms, and instead use DOM and plain old JavaScript together. Do you believe this is achievable? Let me know in the comments which existing framework do you believe to be closest to this goal. Until next time, thank you for watching.